Right now, we're going to talk for a little bit. I know you're excited. We're going to talk for a little bit uh, with the co-creator and uh, executive producer director of it, and then we're going to bring the actors out. So I just want to prepare you mentally. Doctor Who is not coming out yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's his name, right? <laughs> oh, thank God it's not Comic-Con. <laughs> um, please welcome Damon Lindelof and Mimi Leader. Please. Please sit. Hi, guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, will you show off the shirt for oh. them, please? <laughs> this is a little present for the lost writer's room. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the leftovers writer's room this week. We, we all, all the writers got them, so, with their names. You're tremendous nerds. Yes. It's great. We, we love the Game of Thrones. <laughs> um, you guys. Let's talk about The Leftovers. Uh, this was an intense season. Uh, I want to talk about the, I want to talk about this first. Uh, what drew each of you to the material from the beginning? Uh, because Mimi, you came in a little bit later, yeah. right about halfway through the season. Um, and Damon obviously co-wrote the pilot with uh, Tom Parada who wrote the novel. Mm -hmm. um, what drew you initially to the material? Uh, I, um, I'm a, a, a big Parada fan, always have been. I've read uh, uh, all, of his, uh, all of his books. And um, I, I really respond to uh, the tonality of his storytelling. He writes great characters. There's, you know, there's a lot of humor there, a lot of pathos, the stuff that I, that I really respond to. Election is one of my, my uh, favorite movies. Um, give it up for Election and, uh, and Little Children. And there's just this, this thing that Parada does um, in terms of uh, uh, this thing that we all get, which is this is the person that we are uh, presenting ourselves as, but then there's, there's kind of someone, there's something entirely different going on underneath. Um, and then uh, I, was, uh, I was reading the New York Times book review, which um, I essentially read so that I can pretend that I've read books that I haven't read. <laughs> and, uh, and there was a review of, um, of The Leftovers that was written by Stephen King. And uh, I'm also I'm a massive Stephen King fan. That was you know, my dad and I. I think one of the first novels that I read was this was a Stephen King novel. And um, Do you, what was it? Do you remember? It was uh, it was it was probably Pet Cemetery. Um, uh, at that and then and then I went back and read everything that he'd written prior to that and Carrie and Salem's Lot and, and The Stand, which um, you know kind of changed everything for me. But. Uh, but it was like, wow, Stephen King is writing this review of a uh, Tom Parada book, and then I started reading the review, and it was clearly a genre book. This, I, you know, there, there was this idea that, um, you know, behind it, like this supernatural event that occurred in a Tom Parada book, and I was just completely and totally riveted. And uh, and Stephen King said that it was the the best episode of the Twilight Zone that had never been filmed. And I just stopped reading the book review because I was like, I should actually probably read this book. <laughs> and uh, and I was a uh, I. I was in an airport and I bought and I as I, I walked into you know like uh, Hudson News or whatever it is uh, um, and uh, and bought the book and um, and then I just had like three cocktails on the plane and I had an Ambien and I passed out um, <laughs> but then like a day later I got a call from a colleague of mine who had just um, uh, started working at HBO, Michael Ellenberg, and he said, have you read this thing, The Leftovers? Um, we, we, we bought it, and it feels like it's something that's up your alley, and uh, Lost had, uh, um, you, you know, been about two or, two or three years since, since Lost was off the air, and I kind of vowed that I would, um, you know, uh, never do television again, which, um, <laughs> you know, uh, was wrong. And I was feeling the pull of it after some some exploits in Movieville, and so uh, so I was like, oh, this is the stars aligning. I should read this book, and I read it, you know, not in a single sitting, but over the course of a couple of days, and I was just really uh, emotionally uh, engaged by it. Um, and uh, what do you, I, let me interrupt you for a sec. What do you think it was about the themes in the book, or about the the story in the book, that uh, both these HBO folks thought of you and that you responded to? Well, I think that um, uh, there's a mystery element to the book in terms of 2% of the world's population just suddenly and spontaneously disappears. And, um, and what was brilliant about the, the way that Tom wrote it was it was very clear from, you know, 
maybe 10 pages in that you're not going to get an answer to this mystery. And so there was something like fundamentally very liberating about that for me, where, <laughs> 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 where I, I could just basically like, I could say in panels, fuck you guys, ask Parada. <laughs> like, I, this, this wasn't my idea. Um, so uh, uh, that, that was really cool because I love the idea of living in a, in a world of mystery because that's kind of, you know, what it is. Like you choose a religion and you're like, I'm 98% sure that, you know, that this is, this is the right way to go. But the idea that there was something very specific, it wasn't just this people sitting around and smelling their own farts and talking about philosophy, which is my next show. That, <laughs> that's going to be on Cinemax. Um, but, uh, but it had this very defined kind of uh, entry point. And, uh, and I just thought that the characters were incredible. And, um, and I just started feeling it's a, it's a very, it's a very self-contained uh, novel. Um, it had an ending where I was like, I'm okay with this ending. I'm okay with leaving these people here. I don't think like I need to see the continuing adventures of them. But at the same time, the world seems so rich. Um, it just feels like a TV show. Like you shouldn't make this into a movie. You should go deep. And uh, and um, I, uh, I I called Michael Ellenberg back and essentially said, um, you know, I love it. Uh, can I, can I, is, what's, what's Tom's involvement going to be? Because I, I think that there is a, um, you know, there's a system in place uh, in our business where it's basically like, you know, uh, fuck that guy, you're doing the adaptation now. And, um, uh, and whether it's a movie where there's 14 different credited writers or a television show, like, the, I, I didn't really want to do the show unless Parada was going to be intimately involved because I do feel that I do um, have a, uh, um, a strong desire and an inclination and a bad habit of kind of take, you know, embracing the mystery element and the genre element and pushing that really hard. And I was like, I just need a very strong creative influence who's going to keep it grounded at all times. Um, and uh, so Tom and I started exchanging some very sweet emails, and uh, and then he came out to Los Angeles, and we had a sit down, and um, and uh, we we started talking about it, and I became obsessed. There, in the book, there is a um, there's a very brief mention. Uh, Nora Durst is, uh, is like riding her bike. Um, around Mapleton, and she she rides on a path through the woods, and she sees a uh, like a stray dog, and um, and there's like a very oblique reference to the fact that the dogs, um, you know, may have gone crazy on October 14th, and just like the ones who witnessed a departure, just sort of like went and they were having this like feral existence in the woods, and I I was like I want to do the dog show. What's going on with the dogs? <laughs> like. You know, I was like, I have this idea that you know, the 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 first scene in Lost was a guy wakes up in the in the woods and he sits up and he's disoriented and this very sweet dog comes running up to him. Is like, oh, people love dogs. Like, you know, dogs are great. Everything's gonna be okay. No matter what happens over the course of the next six seasons of the show, the fucking dog is fine. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, but on this show, we're gonna fucking shoot the dog. <laughs> You know, we're gonna like right out of the gate. We kill the dog because the dogs are dangerous and they're and they're and they've gone crazy and that's what's happening to people. And Tom was just sort of like, "What? Who are you? What? How did I get into this?" But we then he then he pushed back and we started riffing and I just felt like it was gonna be an amazing collaboration and then you know everything kind of flowed out of that. Well, I wanna, and I want to pick up there in a minute. But, uh, Mimi, tell us about how you got involved and again, what drew you to this material. I like to shoot dogs, too. <laughs> um, I um, was very attracted to this material, uh, the themes of loss, abandonment, grief, and uh, Damon Lindelof. And, and I was like, OK, this is a dream come true. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's just you know, the material that Damon uh, writes is, is, is like ice cream. It's, it's really creamy and it's really beautiful to direct you know and realize and it's you know the best written uh, material I've come across in television or film in a long time and so that's what attracted me to this world um, yeah. let me ask you guys you know Mimi brings up that these themes of grief which are really prevalent through the first half of the season uh, that's some heavy stuff to throw at an audience straight away. And I think in the book, there's a little more time, right? Is that right, that they've, they've established the loss already, and then the story kind of gets rolling. But uh, we're thrown in pretty quickly to these characters' grieving lives. 
Was there a worry uh, on your part that you know it would just that would define the series? Uh, there probably should have been. I mean, I, I, I think that, um, you know, one of the great things about doing this job, but, um, but it's also a slightly terrifying thing, is you have an instinct about something and then you put it out into the world and then the reaction to it can sometimes be surprising. And that's exciting. But I just like, when, when, when words like bleak and depressing and why would I want to watch that ever again, like, you know, started, started coming at us, um, I, I was surprised by it because for, for us, it was just really about trying to capture some sense of, if you're going to do this very genre idea and try to dress it up in a very non-genre presentation, I mean, I, I think that, like, you know, when you just say, you know, 140 million people sort of abruptly disappear, like, how are you going to show that? How are you going to express that? Um, like, for me, it was really just all about, even though the, uh, the book starts three years later, as does the show, but I was like, how are these people feeling? Like, you know, when, when it, just this idea that it could happen again at any time. I know, like, I, I live in Los Angeles, so I know how I feel right after an earthquake. So this idea of, like, you just get, you just kind of get, f Every time you start to kind of feel good about something, you're like, oh, this food is really good. And then something's just kind of bothering you. And you're like, what is it? Oh, right, there was just this earthquake. And I, and I kind of feel like something that happened on that scale, not just physically like, oh, the people that I love could disappear at any moment, which, by the way, is just a fear that we all have. That's not a grief, that's not a grief fear. It's like, you know, you basically, you know, you find someone that you love and you propose to them and, you know, and you have family that you care about. But the idea for any of us who have, who have suffered loss the idea that in a second they could be gone. Um, once it happens, it's jarring because it does. It's not just like, oh, I'm grieving my dad because he's dead. That's sad. But the other thing that happens is you're sort of like, how do I reevaluate everybody else that I know because they could be gone too? And so, how does this look and how does this feel? And how are people who are experiencing this all the time behaving? They'd be going kind of a little bit crazy because normally we're looking around for answers. You know, you look, you know, like what is the Pope going to come out? On, on his balcony and basically say, don't worry, this is what the departure was, and l allow me to contextualize it for you, and all you have to do is come to church every day, and you're going to feel better, then the pope is basically, he's fucking gone, you know? So, so I, I really like that idea of a world where kind of everybody was looking for answers, and I live in a world that is predominantly, you know, we're, we're people of science, you know, we, we bend towards atheism, but, it, it, but we're all afraid to say that we believe in God, and we describe ourselves as like, well, I'm kind of spiritual. Like, <laughs> you know, I kind of believe that like everybody's connected and is like, you're fucking talking about the force. Just say, <laughs> just say you believe in the force. Like, you know, but we, we, we kind of don't know how to qualify it. And it was like, so th the idea that people were afraid, that they were pushing away the people that they cared about most because they were afraid of losing them. So that's what we tried to put on the page. And then if someone had just said to me at any time in the process, do you, you know, do you think anyone's going to want to watch this? You know, and when I saw this poster, I was like, yes, it's that. But then I don't understand, like, when you drive by that poster, you're like, God, like, I'd much rather watch, like, fucking Tyrion dealing with dragons. Like, I, I, don't, I don't need that. I mean, I kind of need it. Um, but well, but uh, it's actually it's terrific, and I knew it. I know it drew me in because it's this arresting. That's my body and Justin's head, by the oh. way. <laughs> Just so we're clear. But it, there, there's a, a true emotion that is somehow conveyed even in the advertising campaign. And I want to talk about the getting that emotion on the page and through the actors. But before that, uh, and before we bring them out, I just want to ask a quick question about adaptation in general. Uh, when you and Tom started having these conversations, uh, deciding what, how the show would be and how the show would be different to the book, uh, what was involved? Because there are notable differences. This is actually very, um, very germane to Mimi because uh, one, one of the things that we were talking about was in the book, um, the, the guilty remnant are sort of engaged, they're engaged in a behavior of martyrdom. And what they do is like, they, they, they have like an outpost house that they, that they pick their s sort of select members and then they go and then they ask one of the members to shoot the other one. And to make the shooting look like it was perpetrated by a member of the community in order to sort of ratchet up tension. And I was, and I was essentially like, you know, 
they, they can do better than this, the guilty remnant. Like if it, you know, the, we've got to, we've got to delve, the, the, the shooting is, you know, a language that we all understand, but like, what is a, what is a religious hate crime look and feel like on television? I was like, someone should get stoned on this show. Like they, they should stone one of their own and we should, we should be forced to watch it. Here's another thing is like, that's what people want to see. They, they fucking want to see stonings and always on the pulse, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it was sort of met with like, oh, okay, like, uh, he seems really passionate about this, and Parada was into it, et cetera. But you could kind of see, like, people were, um, like, a little bit hesitant about it. And Mimi was the, you know, the only, I, the only person, at least in my memory, who was like, fuck, yes. <laughs> like, and that was, that, was the fir- that was the first episode that she directed, and I remember when we were toning it, you know, just that idea of, like, there's going to... There's gonna, she's gonna get hit with the rock like three times further than we should. Like, it's just not, not to be gratuitous, but the, I, and, and, and so when we submitted the cut to HBO, they completely and totally embraced the idea, but they did say, and this is what I love about HBO, they never say, don't do this, they just say, are you sure? It's kind of, it's like, I have a Jewish mother, so I'm used to this. It's like, you know, are you, are you sure you want to do that? Um, and it's like, I don't want anyone to feel it's gratuitous, but at the same time, the whole point of it is, it, the reason that the guilty remnant is ultimately doing this, although, although you don't know why it's happening at the time, is kind of like, you have to watch. You have to remember what happened. Like, every time the show starts to spin out of this, bandwidth of like, oh, everything's going to be okay. The Guilty Remnant is there to basically say, no, this thing happened and everything has changed. They're disruptors. You know, they're protesting against normalcy. So it actually, like, and you can't explain that to someone. They either are so dark and fucked up that they totally just intuit it. And I, I mean, that is the greatest, you know, it's, it's you know, at, at that time when we started watching Mimi's Dailies, that was when we, we called her up and said, you need to, st- you can't leave after you direct this episode. You are now going to be, you know, you're, you're you're not, you're not producing the show. Like you're, you're, you're the point person in New York, and thank God she's, she's, she's leading the charge in season two. But I think like it's just, uh, you know, as as uh, as 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 my therapist is kind of saying, is is, uh, is fond of saying when I'm when I'm uh, beating myself up, which is all the time, is like, look, the show's just not for everybody, and um, and like just surround yourself with the people who it's for, and um, and fortunately, uh, not just with Mimi, but also, you know, our amazing production team on on all sides, um, like. Uh, if if one of them says this is too far or I don't I'm not feeling this, then I know that it's the wrong idea. Versus you know when they all sit up and say like yes, um, th- I, I I trust the uh, the collaborative process. Yeah, and, and you can tell on shows when the collaboration is truly happening, and and I think it really is on this show. Let's meet some of those collaborators. Yes, <laughs> please welcome uh, Christopher Eggleston, Carrie Coon, and Ann Dowd. Welcome, you guys. You do have microphones. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Let, let me ask you all the same question that I, I let off with these guys. Uh, what initially drew you to this material? It is potentially difficult material. Uh, you are all uh, brilliant, in-demand actors. Uh, why? Why is this? We tell why is that this to my show? agent? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what What appealed to you about this show? It's difficult material. I mean, as a woman, I feel that I'm rarely asked to do anything challenging. I'm just asked to recycle the same tropes over and over again. The long-suffering wife, the bitchy girlfriend, the lesbian detective, like <laughs> over and over again. And I, and I was so, part, right, no, I, I'm, I'm fighting Chris off <laughs> with the stick. But, um, and I had read Tom Parada's novel and I really actually connected with Nora when I read it years before the, it became a show. So it was such a privilege to get uh, the opportunity to audition for it. What about you guys? Chris? Uh, it was the same thing for me. I read the novel, and uh, Matt Jameson was the person that I connected with. Really? Yeah. Uh, is, is there, are there thematic elements to the character? I mean, what, what is it? 
actually, let, let's dig a little deeper that you guys connected okay. with. Well, is this going to be therapy? Huh. <laughs> well, I, if we do I, it right. What, what I can say is that Chris and I met in in London. I was I was doing press for uh, for the second Star Trek film, and he was there. And I knew, uh, and I had, we we were starting to cast the leftovers, and we had gotten word that he was interested in Matt Jameson based on the book because I don't think the script was even circulating. And if it was, Matt Jameson has like three lines in the script. But we had sort of all, you know, Tom and I had already kind of been interested in that. You know, this is the one character who's representing religion, you know, in terms of his being. And I think that the trope is this is a priest who's lost his faith. And um, and we, we we were sort of like, we don't want to do that, but we don't know what uh, what to do yet. And then you and I, we, we met and we we had a coffee. And uh, in my memory, uh, we ended up having like a like a two hour conversation about religion, about our, 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 our beliefs. Yeah, we did. I just thought it was very interesting that Tom dropped this character in and that was right at the center of the argument but didn't use him that much. So I felt, obviously, he, there, was, there was scope for him to develop. Sure. What, what was the nature of that conversation? Uh, what were some of the things that came out that we later maybe got to see in the show? I, I remember saying, don't drink anymore, Damon. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. And I did not heed that advice. But, <laughs> But I, but I do think whether you, it was something that you, you were. I asked you about your, your, your belief. I, I yeah. asked you whether you believed in Had, God. Basically. Right, right. Yeah. And you said lost? to me, "What did he say?" I'm dying question. to know. Yeah. No, we talked about God, but then I, 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 my takeaway from the conversation, and I can't remember what it was that you specifically said, was I was, I was saying this. In in the in the book, Matt Jameson has a crisis of faith. So he he's a he's a he's an evangelical uh, priest who, when the rapture happens, it doesn't happen by his definition of the rapture, which is o only the good people go, so assholes go too. And so his reaction to that is like, well, I'm not going to be religious anymore. And I think Chris said something to me uh, along the lines of, no, he wouldn't do that. He he, you know, he did I? Say yeah. No, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, he would do. You, you said, my, my memory of it is that you said something like he would double down, you know, he'd become more religious, you know, um, like, and, and, the, and, and then I was suddenly like, okay, there's got to be a gambling set piece for this guy at some point. But, you know, but I, I you were, e even though you were presenting in terms of, of Chris Eccleston's system of beliefs, you, you, you understood Matt Jameson, and I think in a way, you want to cast actors who understand the characters better than you do, so that when you're writing them, you're, the actor is just talking to you, and it actually feels like cheating, because you're just, <laughs> no, you're, and it's, it is that way with all, uh, you know, with, with all the actors on the show, where, you know, you're just kind of channeling um, uh, what they're doing. It doesn't feel like it's something that you're writing. That's how you know you've got the casting right, and when you don't, you just kill them off. <laughs> uh, oh, good to know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Truth comes out. You mostly kill them off. Most I wanted to answer your question. Um, Thank you, Anne. When I, when, I, when I first read the script, I didn't get it. <laughs> I put it down and I said, well, I'm not kidding. I can tell you this because we're family now. I said, well, I won't be going in for this. <laughs> I don't get it. And... Uh, I'm kind of a kitchen sink kind of gal. I want to be able to touch it and identify it. And then I thought, you know what, honey, you're, you might want to have another look. And then I thought, wow, she doesn't talk. She, and I'm a talker. <laughs> and she's suffered tremendously, and she doesn't give a shit. And I admire that tremendously in that character. So that was the appeal for me, was her trip and the fact that she's arrived at a place of strength and solidarity, or if yeah. that, okay. that, that. That makes a lot of sense, and it sort of leads me to another question I had for you guys, and because and, it's sort of a look inside your process of how you start to approach a character. Uh, all three of you here are, I'm, I'm not kidding when I say you are heavy hitty, hitting actors. You are, you know, stage trained, uh, you're theater actors, and there's an aspect to this show yes, definitely. that is. Mm -hmm. Theatrical is the wrong word, but it could take place on a stage. Uh, and I think that has something to do with the emotional honesty mm -hmm. of the show. Uh, how do you guys dig deep and find that in, you know, amid the lights and cameras of a television? And Mimi, how do you work with them to bring that out? 
<laughs> yeah, we go deep into process here. Yeah. <laughs> this um, is ATX, guys. Well, this is uh, some <laughs> Comic Con. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you say, they are seasoned actors, and they dig deep. They come to set, and they are completely prepared, and they have their opinions, and as do I. And we usually pretty much feel the same way about things, and we you know, have a very, very much respect for the process of letting it uh, evolve. And we're very to the point. And we don't rehearse a lot. You know, we, we let it happen on film, you know. Mm. Well, you know, it's funny, the other night, am I in the show? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, here, here's what I'll say is, it, it would have, it would have been like really obnoxious to invite you to Austin just to be on a panel. Like, so. But I would remember like, his former I, yeah. words, you know. I don't want to, I don't want to say that you're still on the show. Well. I, I, I Okay, but, so. But, it's always a pleasure to but see you. But I, Let's yeah, it is. Thanks for coming. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's just say you were, let's just say you were hanging out on set and the cameras may have been pointed at you. Yeah. Damon is yeah. such a good guy, yeah. you know? <laughs> okay, but when I was pretending to film the other night, <laughs> or not, uh, this is in relation to the theater, yeah. um, I started to feel the panic rise up because the material is very challenging. It's beautifully written, and it's the kind of writing where you don't want to change words. And you don't change words in the theater. It just doesn't happen. There's something about the respect for the writing, and not, when, not that you would with other writers, but there's something when you can tell, I gotta get this as written. And the terrain is difficult. Who are they? Where are they going? And you rehearse in a theater for a long time for a reason, and the depth of this material and the density of the writing, I felt the panic rise up. I thought, should I? I don't know what to do. I, I don't get it. And we had work to do. And I thought, come on, girl. You've been in a theater where you've had to stand up on a night when you don't get it and do it anyway to the best of your ability and just know somehow you will get through. You've got a team. You're not alone. Let the panic dissipate, and you will do the best you can. That's very helpful, uh, that um, time spent on a stage when you want to jump out a window. <laughs> do you know? Do you, do you guys have that dream where you're about, where you have to go on stage and you don't know what it's for and, like, and what you're supposed to say? I don't have that one. I have the one where I show up t for a test and I just thought, shit, I never read any of it. Right. Yeah. I don't know what it's about. Yeah. I can't face that no lines because that would I'd have a heart attack in right. my sleep. But anyway. uh, Carrie and Chris, when you receive a script uh, for a new episode, what, what is your process? What's the, what do you start to do? Well, I think what Anne said is very germane. It's uh, the material, the writing is always really solid. So I, if, if I have a tiny dispute, I might write Damon a one sentence email. It's like, is that sentence right? But that's usually all as far as that goes. What are the nature of those sort of Oh, questions? you know, uh, I haven't had a lot of that, frankly. The writing is so strong. But I always am aware of us not being the same as the other things I don't do because they're boring. So if I s hear, smell any hint of like, oh, I don't want her, her to be like that, I might mention it. But but Damon is so, he trusts his actors so much and he's so amenable to that. And it happens so rarely. But I, I feel like for me, the preparation for anything that's coming happened before I got the job in a way. Because I connected, uh, when I was a little girl, I used to wake up during Johnny Carson and come out of my room. I was like five. And my parents would be watching late night and I'd be like, just so we're clear, like, is Jesus coming back soon? And do you know when? And am I going to get married and have kids? Or is that like off the table? And they'd just be like, OK, honey, you're, it's fine. It's not happening in your lifetime. Go to bed. Did, honey, or? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, they weren't really paying attention. Uh, and so I was so always deeply uh, terrified of the apocalypse. It's such a part of the fabric of my being <laughs> that when, yes, that when a show addressing the, my sort of deepest fears of apocalypse and abandonment came along, it was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> my wheelhouse, you know? And so in some ways, the, the writing is, is strong enough that it, it allows you to embrace 
uh, those things. And so when I get scared on set, like Anne was talking about, like, oh man, I don't know what to do. It's really a, a matter of sort of opening into your fear and being not afraid to uh, show it. Uh, hopefully. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> hopefully. Just to speak briefly to what Carrie said, although I am getting a t-shirt that says, like, <laughs> you, you don't change the words in theater, or, you know, or whatever it is, but this is TV. I'm married no. to a playwright, yeah, you one. do not but change the words. No, no, it's not insulting, it's wonderful. I, I, but, but I also kind of feel like, one, one of the things that happens, obviously, um, The Leftovers is not exclusively written by Tom and I. We have a room full of in, in immensely talented writers, all of who have very specific voices. And one of my criteria for, for hiring people, like, if you, if you like me or you like my work, you didn't get hired. So when I was staffing The Leftovers, people would be like, oh my god, I'm so into loss. And I'd be like, get the fuck out of here. Because <laughs> you need to feel the same way about me that I feel about me. And I also need to, you know, I need... <laughs> I need, no, no, I'm not, no, 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 no sympathy, but. We are no. going to get to the bottom of this today. He will be fine by the no, time we leave. But you're not, you're not, you're not going to generate anything cool from, you know, from sycophancy, if that's, yeah. if that's a word. Um, so, so the idea of like, you, you, you hire people with very distinct voices who will fight you. Mm -hmm. And the, and the same is true of actors. And it's the way that they fight is key. Mm -hmm. But I think that when I get what, what we would convey as like pushback, but like if Carrie sends an email and says, I just want you to look at this, it's very significant. Or when Mimi says, I'm not sure what you're trying to say here, it's very significant because we're, we're all the custodians of this show. And, and my job when I'm writing a scene is, so Kevin's in the scene and Jill's in the scene and Nora's in the scene. And, the, and on a story level, the scene needs to achieve this. Well, it's possible that I might just like neglect Nora because I need to get the scene to, I need to get this thing to happen. And then it's up to the actors to basically say, I get that you need to have that thing happen, but I just want you to know, you know, I, I'm Nora, like I live in Nora, and, and just a, a piece of counsel, like I, I, I think she may be coming off like this, and I don't think you want that. Mm -hmm. It's not passive aggressive, and then it will always, it, it'll always initiate a change, because I take it very seriously. I think when you're in a scenario, and I've been in this scenario, too in television and in movies where you know where the material just isn't working and, and and the actors know that it's not working and the director knows that it's not working and you're just kicking the tires constantly and then it becomes even when it starts to work everyone is completely and totally used to just kicking the tires and you never reach that point of like we're just going to have faith in this material you just want to you you have to start from a place of fundamental faith but but I also feel like that 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 feedback is absolutely crucial because you know I, I have, you, you know, I have, and the writers have, you know, a dozen characters to be to be thinking about, and at any one time, you you might be servicing one character, and you put the other character in service of them, and then you betray them, and you just never want to betray them because the audience will, will the audience will smell it, and if you hate a character on a television show, um, it's not the, you know, it's 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 because it's 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 because it. The, the story or, or another character is basically completely and totally subsumed them. Yeah, I think that's, it's a smart thing that, you know, we've seen in... in that said, I'm not changing a fucking word. <laughs> I, see, I see the wheels turning. I think Chris just quit. <laughs> He's never had an email from me. <laughs> Chris, I want to ask you about, you, you had an episode in this first season uh, that rested almost fully on your shoulders. On my uh, ego. <laughs> can can you talk about this episode and you know summoning the uh, emotional wherewithal to get through this episode and to be uh, honest and use your microphone, please. <laughs> I can project. <laughs> <laughs> the recording. I um I wanted to talk about a l just a little bit about uh, um, my tr m this this thing of I've never changed the word in television or. Or theater or film. Um, I, I, I don't know if I'm sure everybody's read that book, Difficult Men Inside the Television Revolution. I've talked to you about it. Mm -hmm. And that, that That's was. That's Sepinwall's. Uh, or. It might, no, be, it might be the other one. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. But if you guys. There difficult are two men. It's called Difficult Men. The Sepinwall one's amazing. And it's yeah. about the rise of the showrunner and this culture that has thrown up this television that, that American you make now. 
So this is a, a new experience for me working in American television. My drama school training was Shakespeare and Miller and Strindberg and you didn't change a word. And then I worked with really fantastic British television writers like Jimmy McGovern and Peter Flannery and you didn't change a word. So I, 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 I mean, I've never, I don't think I've ever asked you for a, a, a line change. It's just an interesting, I've met American actors, not these two, but I've met American actors who, who like rewrite fucking scripts. <laughs> and frankly, I want to fucking kill them. <laughs> because for me, the writer is at the center of the culture, and it's not just because he's flown in for this. The writer is at the center of the culture for me. That, that, was, mm -hmm. that was how I grew up. Anyway, that's that's my rant. All but it, it has to I, be writers are not act, you know actors are not writers. Yeah. Anyway, but th there has anyway. to be some it, as part of that collaboration. You know, if you're not going to change a word, you as an actor have to find your way in a phrase or a scene or whatever it is that might be different. But they know the character. I mean, right. I, I I I feel. But you don't just show up and you know say no. Bye. I don't just <laughs> no, but. You're I, actually I, I think Anne and Carrie would probably say sometimes your job as an actor is not to get in the way. Hmm. Yeah. And that's what I've learned as I've, you know, when I was younger, I was forever trying to do my Marlon Brando and my Robert De Niro and this, that and the other. And as you get a bit older, you think, oh, I'll just stay out of it a bit, especially when it's as well written as this. Um, I think our, our job is, right? is to go to the story, not make the story come to us. We go to the yeah. story. Simplicity. Yeah, or just get out of your own. Get out of the way. It's not my story I'm telling. It's mm -hmm. another story. Am I ruining it by acting, asking about process? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I have process. Yeah. You know, I, that's something you do to your hair, isn't it? <laughs> not, not us. Oh. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> we, what I loved about, I, I've, you know, people in my country, for instance, there's a real snobbish attitude to television. It's like, oh, he's a telly actor, he doesn't do film. I love television, and I love the pace that we make television with. And when we did this first series, we established in New York, because we were all so cold, <laughs> that we did not hang around. And that's what Mimi yeah. said about, we rehearse on film because we want to go home. <laughs> But we, so you have to make decisions yeah. quick, but fortunately we've got great writing, and, we, and I think we're well cast, and we, we're led by Justin Theroux, who's not here today, who leads us with generosity and absolute, yeah. so generous, and uh, you know, so we make quick decisions, and we want that energy transferred onto the, onto, on, on, onto the screen. It's not a precious thing, really, this show, even though it's about, uh deep feeling, we, mm -hmm. we just do it. <laughs> well, that's, that's yeah. part of the human thing that we're seeing on screen, is because it is spontaneous, because it is very natural. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about, you know, what each character wants, and the reason to really, you know, shoot the rehearsals is you might miss it. You might miss this beautiful, unrehearsed moment that just happens, and, and it's, it's, it's really important to the material. Uh, all right, I want to make sure we have time for questions from you all. Do you have questions? Yes? OK. Uh, here's what I would like. Uh, please think of your question really right now. Uh, condense it to one sentence. Yeah. <laughs> commas, commas and run-ons are acceptable. That's so great. Within reason. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, questions begin with a W or an H, not with an I. Is there, so is there an audience mic? That's good. That's amazing. Really good. Yeah. I'm very good at this. Yeah, you've yeah. done this before. Is there an audience microphone? If not, I'll walk around with it. All right. Um, our first question is right here. Please stand up. This young woman. <laughs> this young woman. Brave. Audience hog, sorry. Um, you have this brilliant way of shifting a narrative, using, uh, you know, the word gimmick semantically doesn't feel right, but a gimmick in your narrative, in the way you structure things, that has obviously made you quite famous, but the balls it takes to, in your third episode of a brand new show to take one single character and build an entire episode around someone who we barely know. Like, as a writer here, I would never, it would never occur to me to have that kind of just even confidence or strength of storytelling to make that decision. What 
made you make that decision? And, and did you have that fear that it was a wrong one? Because it was brilliant. And, but I, that's a terrifying decision to have to make. <laughs> Thank you, young lady. Um, I, <laughs> I, I have to say before I answer this question, and and I and I in a, in, a, in a town that uses hyperbole often, that Julie Pleck and Kevin Williamson, who's sitting next to her, gave me my break. I was a uh, I was a writer's assistant. Yeah. I was. I was a writer's assistant taking notes on uh, on Kevin's follow-up to Dawson's Creek uh, Wasteland, while he was editing, uh, teaching Mrs. Tingle, uh, and um, and they uh, both, you know, uh, sort of very early on said, "You are, you know, you're a writer. Get an agent." And um, because they said that, every the, that, that's why I'm sitting before you uh, guys here, and I'm uh, I'll never ever forget it. And it, it's a huge deal. I I think that. Though, apropos of, of that story, is like the best kind of risk is something that doesn't feel like a risk until someone tells you it is. And like, so like we look at people who are like, you know, jumping out of planes or, or, or and they're just like, what? Um, and I think that, you know, certainly when I met with, with Chris and we were talking about, you know, once we got into the conversation about like, we want you to do this, it was like, you're not just going to be an extra on the show. The way that the show is going to work is you're never going to know who the next episode's going to be about. So at any point, we could shift the point of view. And then Justin is going to have to be an extra in your episode. So, so Thoreau, you know, everybody has to be down for that because a lot of people who are going to be number one on a call sheet, you know, they expect they're, you know, hey, look, that, that's the poster, man. Like, <laughs> so the third episode, Justin, you are in, you know, you're, in, you're going to be in one scene here and you're going to come into a, to a, a hospital uh, room as, as Matt is getting tended to and you're going to invite him over for dinner and then you're, you, that's, I'll see you in two weeks. And he's like, cool. So like, Everybody, everybody, and it's not, he's not lazy by any stretch of the imagination. He knows that he's going to be in service of this other character story. And um, uh, we, we were talking about this brief, briefly earlier, but The Wire, which I think is, you know, the greatest television show ever. That isn't to say that I don't love Breaking Bad and Sopranos and, and other things, but the, the way that it was able to do that, to shift character point of view, you know, the second season was about these guys on the docks that we had never um, even met, and all the characters who we had grown attached to in the first season suddenly became really just extras, like background, in the second season of the show, with the exception of, uh, you know, Stringer and everything that was, was happening there. Like, I was just, like, completely and totally amazed by the audacity of it, but David Simon would be like, what? Like, and so, you know, I was, I was certainly trying to emulate something that I loved, but I also know, like, where's the risk in taking Christopher Eccleston and making him the star of his own episode? Because the presentation of Matt Jameson as a, as a crazy person who's handing out these flyers um, and then suddenly saying, like, all right, now let's go find out why he's doing that. Um, let's learn a little bit more about this guy. So then in episode four, in episode five was really the next significant time that we saw him when he shows up at the cold the sack um, uh, with Lori, we see that this transformation has occurred in this character. He's, he's now zeroed in on saving the GR. You'd want to know, like, how did that happen? How did we shift him out of this one thing? We have to show you that journey. And so it just felt like it was absolutely essential. And then, you know, and, and again, like, not just because I'm on their network, but everything you hear about HBO is true, which is they weren't even like, this is, are you sure you want to do this? They were like, we love this script. Like, this is cool. So, you know, it, it didn't really occur to me, you know, I, w one of the things, it, the first time it really occurred to me was when a show, uh, particularly a cable drama, is going to go out into the world, by then you probably have like four or five of them done. So we, p we released the first four episodes of The Leftovers to sort of the, you know, the critics. And the critics all sort of like said, like, here's, uh, I like the show, I don't like the show, I want more of the show, I don't, you know, that this is the way the show makes me feel, but they all started saying like, but episode three is this very, like, complete and total deviation from everything that precedes it and blah. And that was really the first time that I was like, uh, okay, I, I guess so. It just, it felt like another episode of The Leftovers. And all I can say is, you, you can't do it as a gimmick. You have to do it when it comes naturally. Timing is everything. And, you know, like, but 
uh, and, and sometimes you're going to fail too. You can't be, you know, if I lived in fear of making mistakes as a storyteller, I would literally never write a word. Um, I always start from that place. And you guys know, this is the beauty of television. It's just like, they're shooting fucking something in five days, you know, like oh you, you, you better flip open your laptop. So, but that's great. Thanks, Thanks Julie Plack. Thank you, Julie Plack. Uh, you guys, this is, it's the most overqualified audience we've ever had. We have another question here. Uh, here's Emily Rose, you guys. <laughs> oh, God. Hi, so um, you have such great themes like we talked about of grief and abandonment and loss, and there's all these visceral, visceral visuals of the stoning and everything. I'm curious from a writing point of view and also seeing it every day on set, is it hard to step away from that? Or how do you, do you have to ever shake that? Um, I know, Carrie, you had that wonderful scene where you come down and you are seeing your family again for the next time. And it was just riveting, it was moving. Do you find that at this point in your careers you're able to sort of, you know, check in and check out? Or is it something that's actually hard to shake? I come from the school of belief that oftentimes actors, and maybe it's the same for writers, seem to me actually to be the healthiest people in the world because, I know that's against stereotype, <laughs> uh, because we actually are fully expressed in a way that most people aren't. Like my family's from the Midwest and they're deeply passive aggressive, repressed people. <laughs> and I, oh, mom. Yeah, <laughs> right. And I kind of got out of there because that wasn't working for me. But uh, I, I get to have a catharsis, you know? The hardest part actually about it is that you have a catharsis, right? And by nature, you've had a release. And then you have to do it again, which is actually very counter to what a catharsis means. So when you have to do that eight times, that's when it gets hard. And then you're spent. There's really no, no, nothing left over to think about or, or feel, because you've kind of gotten it all out there. So I actually find it to be really healthy. I, I don't know if, if it's the same I, thing. I gave up going to therapy <laughs> uh, doing this show. <laughs> <laughs> I love to get lost there and stay for as long as I stay. Because the good thing about getting older is perspective, if you will. And I know I'm going to come back. But I don't mean in the show. <laughs> but I love, I love because those areas. that would now. be ridiculous. <laughs> She's dead. I love Austin. It's just She's such a nice dead town. She's as dead gets. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? Once you, if you can get to that place of grief and loss and it takes you right down, you know, in the end, that's our terrain, and we're comfortable in it, if you will. Yeah, uh, more questions? I'm going to go right here, because it's close. I'm sorry. I'll come back there in a minute. I'm going to hold this, though. You're going to hold this? Perfect. Uh, this question is for um, Senor Damon Lindelof. Um, Senor. I, I, will answer, I will answer en espanol. Awesome. That should be interesting. Um, what would you say is probably one of your biggest lessons that you learned working on television, going from Lost, still favorite show of all time, to The Leftovers? Um, uh, uh, first off, you, um, thanks for saying that. Um, I, I try not to um, think about lessons. Uh, I, you. It, it feels like it's um it's a it's a trapdoor into regret because I think that you know um, the idea like our, our brains are constructed in a way from when we're babies that if you just if you touch something incredibly hot or you stick a key in an electrical socket as I did that you just don't do that again um, but it, it was pretty exciting when it happened <laughs> so like I I, I think like I, I guess the meta answer to your question is like, kind of every lesson, every time I feel like I've learned a lesson, I do go and stick the key in the electrical socket again and again and again because the heart wants what the heart wants. And like, like I, I will have successes and I will have failures, but the worst thing that could ever happen to me is that I would, you know, that I would achieve some level of incredible success, but I would feel no connection with that material. Like, and so I just, you know, uh, that I, I can look at you in the eye and say, I am aware that this was a mistake on Lost, but, but wait, 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 wait. This time, it, I'm not gonna make that same mistake. 
fake. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I guess this is a very um, verbose way of saying I've learned nothing. <laughs> We have, we have time for a couple more questions. We're way back here. Hi, when did you know that you were going to get a season two, and how did that affect uh, the storytelling in season one? Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, and, and to pivot back to Rose's question very briefly, like I was super depressed during season one. Like um, uh, a, a large part of it was just, uh, I think the material itself and sort of living in that space and just like a season, anybody who who you guys have spoken to over this weekend will tell you that season one of a television show is just like the fir uh, for if for any parents in the crowd is just like it's kind of like the first you know couple months of having a baby where you're just like how did they fucking let me take this thing home from the hospital <laughs> like I just I, I, I have no idea what I'm doing and you know like that's kind of the process but but um, HBO was overwhelmingly supportive, um, uh, you know, very early on, and was really liking the material. And although there was stuff that was working and stuff that was not worth working, they they showed an unprecedented amount of faith. And I think the great thing about working in this space, whether it be HBO or, or Netflix or Showtime, is like there's almost a default position of we're investing in you. Like even if you know, as long as you don't, as long as you are a professional, like, and you are trying really hard, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give you a lot of Rope to hang yourself with, and so, um, like, because we understand that a lot of shows really start to pop and sizzle and find themselves in in season two or even in season three. So they they were messaging from very early on, but I think like by by the by time they saw the the cut of Mimi's show, which was episode five, the uh, which was called Gladys, that was the first time that they communicated officially. We we you got you better start thinking about where you're going to go from the end of season one because we had we had told them when we just talked about what the season was going to be, look, season one is Tom's book. We're adding a lot of different elements, but the last scene of season one is Nora Durst is going to walk up to Kevin Garvey's house. We're going to hear her her letter to him, and then she's going to find this baby that has been left by Tom Garvey. That's going to be the last scene, just as it is in the book. Like, there's no reason to change that. It's going to be amazing, and 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 people are going to feel like we can, these people are going to be okay. Like, I, I don't want to have the season end on some kind of crazy, dramatic uh, cliffhanger of like, Nora's holding the baby and says, look what I found. And then Kevin says, but wait, look at that. And there's a fucking meteor. <laughs> like, no, like, that's, that's the end. So, like, let's, let's not, let's just not even, let's just not even talk about a season two until, until, um, until we've got, until we've shot that and we can all take a deep breath. And HBO is very patient and very kind. And they, we, we tabled the conversation until the finale was complete. And then, you know, a, as the actors will say, I was kind of saying like, I don't need, I need to be very, I need to be really living in the present time. Like I just can't be, you know, focused on the future. But once the season was done and I had a little bit of time to decompress, I started getting really inspired and saying like, as opposed to manufacturing more tragedies to befall these people, which is usually what you have to do, you know, to keep the engine uh, primed, I had an idea that, um, you know, that essentially delivered us unto Austin. And we'll, 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 we'll leave it at that. Um, um, you know, where I kind of, I felt like we had, a, had an opportunity to not do more of the same, but at the same time not abandon what, what the show was about. That's great. We are all, I know everybody here is excited about it. Um, let's end uh, as we always end, and let's talk about TV for a second. And uh, starting here with Anne and coming down, what are you watching on television these days? What are you excited or inspired <laughs> about? What do you love? What are you talking to your friends and uh, family about? I'm going to be the dud in the group. Hmm. Um, I have three children, and I'm playing a role here. Um, I don't see a lot of television. Uh, so sorry, that's a bad answer. You know you can make something up, we wouldn't know. Yeah. What are your kids watching? Well, one is in the doghouse, he's <laughs> off television completely. <laughs> Uh, I, you Tell know, why, huh? because, mm. he just because he just, can I just say, That's a great story. in the first half hour of yesterday's babysitter, I live in New York City, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> My son bought $935 worth of camping equipment. <laughs> He's 10 years old, he bought two tents. One of them sleeps 12 and the other is a three bedroom Who wants tent. to go camping? <laughs> 
You're in. Anything You're in, that guy resembles in the back. technology yeah. has been removed yeah. from his hands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, you have a good excuse. Thank you. He was also suspended for two days for breaking a door, but hey. <laughs> He's a good kid. He's a my, my favorite show is uh, it's, com- it's starting on E this fall, it, and it's called uh, Camping with the Doubts. I ju- it just got greenlit seconds ago. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those people that's just always really far behind. So I actually just finished watching Enlightened with Laura Dern. Yeah. And I think Mike White is a genius, and I just, I think he's really getting after something really um, beautiful and interesting. So I finished that. I'm really looking forward to Silicon Valley season two. He gets really funny and smart. Is that it? Is that kind of... And then otherwise we're watching, you know, my husband and I like watch Fellini then like on Friday, so. You're fun. Chris. I have two children. (laughs) And one of them's three and four months, and one of them's one and eight months. So I watch CBeebies all the time. Does anybody know what CBeebies is? It's a BBC channel, with a children's channel, and there is a guy on it whose surname I do not know. His, his first name is, is Justin, and he does a show called Something Special, which is... Um, <laughs> Wait, you're going to feel bad about yourselves. <laughs> he plays a learning disabled character in the show. And everybody who appears in the show with him are, have a learning disability. And he's one of the best actors I've ever seen. And what's very interesting to me to my chil- uh, is to watch my, chil- my two children, Albert and Esme, watch this show and respond to these children with complete acceptance. I wish I knew his, his, his it's second. It, it's an am, it, it, listen, it's an amazing. I'm being evangelical about the show now. <laughs> the show is called Something Special, and it's on CBeebies, and it's created entirely by this guy, Justin. And to my shame, I don't know his surname. Well, you're all online right now. And the rest, of the, time, the rest of the time, I watch 70s American film. And when I came to Austin, I walked around for a while, and for some reason, I thought the film I have to see is the last picture show. Oh, wow, yeah. 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 And I've been watching that for the last two nights. Mm-hmm. Great. Mimi? Well, I haven't really had time to watch a lot of TV lately, oh. but I very much got into Transparent, and which I thought was just brilliant. And so now I'm segueing right into I am Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> Damon, don't let me down. Uh, I... Uh, for for someone who who does this for a living, I I justify my um, immense television consumption by saying you know I have to do this because I do this for a living. But I just you know I was raised in front of a television, and uh, you know uh, whether I'm addicted or not, it's just my it's my it's my favorite and most important medium. And even if I'm writing until you know 2:30 or 3 in the morning, I need to watch TV before I go to sleep to just kind of reset my brain and you know take it out of act active mode and into passive mode, uh, which uh, is getting harder and harder, you know, qualitatively, you know, with TV being what it is. But I, you know, I'm a a pop culture addict, so I try to watch everything that I can. One of my favorite things to do is just, you know, flip around and watch something for, for, uh, for 20 minutes. But the shows, you know, that I'm, uh, you know, currently obsessed with are, are not going to shock anyone here. You know, I, I, I obviously love Game of Thrones, and um, but the but the show that I feel uh, is a, is is um, probably for no one in this room, but is about to kind of really break through in the same way that Breaking Bad did. Where people we we all forget that Breaking Bad was not a show that anybody gave a shit about for for two or three seasons, um, and then when you, and 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 then it became you know undeniable. Um, I think that same thing is is happening with the Americans now. And, um, and uh, that that show is so extraordinarily amazing. I just sit there, you know, and like stop hating myself for, you know, normally no, but Ke- I'll, I'll bet you Kevin and Julie can speak to this, which is, you know, like some TV shows, they're just so good that you just like I don't need this, like this, <laughs> this, you know, like I'll, and and uh, like I can put aside my own narcissism and actually enjoy the Americans for its brilliance. But there are there there are too many to name in terms of uh, like uh, I, I watch uh, everything that has has been mentioned up here except for uh, Chris. 
show, which I am now going to. Check it out. actually sounds kind of amazing, yeah. Uh, well, this is, amazing. this is what makes you, Damon, the ideal ATX guest. You could very easily be an audience member as well, such as your love for television. Please give a round of applause to the creators and cast of The Leftovers. Thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks for coming all weekend. Thanks to everyone at ATX. Give them another round of applause, please. Oh, yeah.